Hey everybody, good to see you all. So I'm Austin, I'm one of the co-founders of Omni. Uh, and so the title originally was What's Wrong with Interoperability. I made it a little more positive. The open liquidity is what we're gonna be talking about. We're actually not gonna be talking about Omni at all. Uh, you know, if you have questions about it afterwards, happy to tell you about it. But that's kind of the whole point of this presentation is that like we kind of double clicked a little too deep into specific interop solutions. And uh, to move forward in a way that is sustainable for the ecosystem at large, we need to establish neutral standards uh, for these interoperability systems to actually like utilize. Uh, but we'll get into it here. That's at large what we're going to be talking about. So, you know, a couple of years ago, we talked about a roll-up centric roadmap. Uh, this was very much like an idea when it was initially kind of talked about. It's very much become a reality though. Uh, and now we're at a point where it's really becoming a serious problem for the Ethereum ecosystem at large, to the point that Solana just objectively, if we think about it, is providing a better user experience in many different ways. Uh, it's much faster, it's much easier to use. You don't need to think about like, okay, did I leave my funds on like this part of the state machine over here? And like, I need to go think about it and like move them, wait 15 minutes. It's actually like substantially easier to use some of these other platforms today. So I build in the Ethereum ecosystem because I care about increasing personal freedoms for people at large. And I think the Ethereum stack has the best opportunity to uh, give that to people. Um, so this is something that we need to solve and something we need to solve quickly because we're now processing substantially more transactions on rollups than we are uh, on Ethereum L1 itself. Uh, and this trend is only going to continue. As we continue to onboard more users, they're going to be on rollups. This is just clearly the future at this point. So if we don't solve all this fragmentation that is happening across the Ethereum ecosystem, really it's kind of like a death by a thousand cuts uh, type thing. Like we just don't have as good of performance properties at large. Uh, and so if we don't actually like solve this problem and get the global network effects that made Ethereum network, uh, the Ethereum network really fantastic alongside the like core properties of like openness, neutrality, and censorship resistance, uh, it'll die. That's just like the simple reality. Okay, so uh, I've been building an interoperability actually since 2018. Uh, we haven't done that well. Uh, in this part of the industry, uh, you know, I think it's almost, I think it's actually over half of the money that has been stolen in hacks at large has come from interoperability solutions. Uh, all these massive hacks have happened. And yeah, these like uh, are especially not only like painful for interoperability, it's painful for the industry at large. I think like North Korea took like a majority of this money and that like pulls terrible attention to the space and it's like a serious problem. Um, you know, I started building in 2018. I actually like built my first company from 2018 to 2020. I sold that company and I started another company. We still have not solved this uh, at all. There's like a ton of work to be done uh, in this space. So to kind of like illustrate some of the points that I want to get through in this presentation, we're going to look back a bit in history a bit here and touch on some of these. I want to be like very clear. Uh, this is not at all to call out any specific project or anything. It's really just to illustrate some like abstraction decisions that we have made that I think we made poorly. So. Uh, to be clear, Nomad, ton of respect for this team. I was actually an investor in this project, but it had like a really unfortunate outcome. So uh, I'm gonna walk through what happened with Nomad so that we can like understand one of the first like lessons that I think we should take away here. So Nomad, or Nomad was an interoperability network that was chosen as the effective canonical uh, interoperability network for the Moonbeam blockchain. Uh, Moonbeam was a new blockchain that spun up and they had a developer ecosystem, but they really wanted to bootstrap an asset ecosystem. It's hard to bootstrap those both in parallel. So, you know, to make their go to market easier, what they did is they worked with Nomad to absorb assets from the Ethereum ecosystem. And so to users, this provided a pretty nice user experience. Uh, if I'm on Ethereum today and I want to go play around with some of the stuff that's happening on Moonbeam, I can just send my ETH to a smart contract on Ethereum and it'll just appear on Moonbeam. Nomad took care of the rest of it. So, uh, you know, you would be issued mad ETH uh, on Moonbeam. And then once I was done messing around on Moonbeam, I could go back to Ethereum basically with the same uh, UX. And so I would just take whatever mad ETH I had, send it to a Nomad contract, and I would get it out on the Ethereum blockchain. Pretty nice from a UX perspective uh, compared to like what we're used to at least. Uh, but the unfortunate thing is Nomad got hacked. Uh, Nomad got hacked and it got drained to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars. And so this effectively destroyed the entire Moonbeam ecosystem. Uh, they never really recovered from this. So why am I talking about this specific example? I'm talking about this because this is uh, an example of a platform giving up sovereignty. Like, Anytime people work with interoperability solutions, if you give up sovereignty, it's a terrible idea. It is a, like simply a bad idea. Um, and this can happen at three levels. So as an asset issuer, you can bake interoperability into your asset. 
This brings a ton of risk to your literal market cap. As a DApp developer, you can bake it inherently into your uh, application, and this risks your users' funds. And then, as we just saw with Moonbeam, uh, if you're a blockchain or a smart contract platform, it's literally your entire ecosystem. And so why is it a bad idea to bake these natively into these different dimensions uh, in the space? Uh, it's because it's extremely hard to create uh, secure interoperability systems. It's actually strictly more difficult than creating secure distributed state machines. Because what are interoperability networks? At a high level, they're a distributed state system that is monitoring other distributed state systems. So it's strictly like a more complex machine that we're building with these. So baking the complexity of that inherently into any level of what you are building is just unnecessarily risky. We don't need to do that, but historically that has been the paradigm in the space, and that has caused us to lose a ton of money and uh, pull a bunch of bad attention into the space. So this one, second lesson that we're gonna touch on, everybody's gonna be familiar with this, liquidity fragmentation, right? Like we're seeing this across Ethereum at large right now. Uh, I'm gonna walk through this with just like a hypothetical example, like, hey, what if Moonbeam didn't want to make their entire smart contract, but like blockchain ecosystem, dependent on Nomad? Well, if they use Daemon, some other interoperability network that provided the same user experience. You know, so we're gonna like go through this UX where, you know, I can send ETH to the Daemon contract, Daemon interoperability network's gonna pick it up, and they're gonna give me damn ETH on the other side because mad ETH is what uh, Nomad was issuing. We're gonna like have the same reverse pattern as well. Um, the problem here is that uh, we don't have a clear canonical ETH anymore. There was a canonical ETH on Moonbeam because they said it's Nomad. Like it was like a social consensus thing that is kind of like in many ways what a canonical asset is. It's like uh, people just agree. Like this is the one we're going to use. If they had done this, uh, they would have had they would have created complexity for developers. Uh, developers wouldn't have known which ETH to integrate. Uh, maybe they integrate both, and they create some abstraction on top that like moves that away from end users. Uh, they would have simply created more user experience uh, complexity. Uh, like, because what ETH do you hold? Which one do you buy? Like, which should you like pick up to like go put in this other DeFi protocol? It's already confusing enough. Like, putting in like multiple versions of a single asset uh, is just yeah going to be even more messy. And so one of the, one of the standards here uh, that I'm going to talk about today is XCRC20. Um, there's a way that you can actually achieve independence from an interoperability protocol uh, using an open standard. Like I said, I'm not going to talk about Omni in this presentation at all. I'm actually just going to talk about open standards, which like bake in the proper abstractions uh, that we should think about as we're working with interoperability solutions. So you know, as an asset is moving across uh, smart contract platforms, they can use XERC20 as a way to uh, achieve that because there's incentives. You know, like if I issue a token on Ethereum and I want to get involved in the DeFi ecosystem on Moonbeam, there's clear uh, like activity and opportunities to like grow my ecosystem there. So I want to get over there, but I don't want to assume existential risk based upon some specific interoperability network. So with XERC20, it's this really cool design where I maintain sovereignty as an asset issuer. I can whitelist bridges. I can say, yeah, I'm down to work with Nomad. Like, that sounds good to me. Uh, I'm also down to like work with Daemon. Now, if Nomad gets compromised, I can throw them out. I can just like de-whitelist them. I maintain sovereignty as an asset issuer. And so like, this is what I mean by like the proper abstractions. Asset issuers should maintain sovereignty. Blockchains and smart contract platforms at large should maintain sovereignty. Same for developers. It should not exist like, there's so many things that are out there today that are like downstream derivative of interoperability protocols. And that just like, I understand the like go to market strategy there as to like how we've gotten into this situation, but it's clearly poor abstraction design. Um, cool. This one is honestly uh, very obvious. Uh, parameterizable security. Like Web2 has been doing this for an extremely long time. We're talking about a smart con or an interop network getting hacked. This is what happens. Like, you know, if they get hacked, the, the whoever hacks it has the ability to just mint an infinite amount of the asset. And what they're going to do is they're just going to dump it to zero in exchange for some other asset that they can like uh, hold and not have stolen from them. Um, the concept of parameterizable security is like, hey, maybe let's not send it all the way to zero in the event of a compromise. Like, let's put in some threshold where like we can flag what's going on and stop it. So XCRC21, one mechanism that they have is rate limits. Uh, pretty simple idea. When you whitelist these bridges, um, you put a certain amount that can go through in a certain period. So, you know, if you're like a small market cap token, maybe don't 
like maybe you say like, okay, it would be very weird if more than $10,000 passed through a route in a day. And you can just prog program that in. Uh, and what that will do is it'll make it so that this chart really just does turn to like worst case scenario, like, okay, bridge gets compromised. Somebody mints $10,000 of like a counterfeit asset and they dump it, but it's just going to like drop. Uh, it's The market impact is going to be marginal compared to this like literal destruction that we've been seeing. Um, so that one's like uh, just like a very kind of obvious thing that we should have been doing for a long time now, but like, you know, uh, late's better than never. So let's like start using these. And this is just kind of like a visualization of what this could look like. So if this is an origin smart contract platform, and this is a destination, the asset issuer themselves maintains the sovereignty to say like, I want to work with these four bridges or like interop protocols. And this is how much uh, of the asset they're going to be able to move. Um, you can just program that in. It's pretty like arbitrarily definable. Um, one thing that in EIP that we haven't released yet, but we've drafted, uh, multi-confirmation isn't the sexiest name, but like it communicates the idea here where it's like a multi-sig of interop networks. If you are working with XCRC20 and you want somebody to be able to move funds from one domain to another, it's nice to have rate limits, you know, but uh, what's even better is that you can kind of flag it like, okay, uh, if somebody, like, let's, let's walk this through uh, with an example. If somebody compromises one of these rationally, what they're going to do is there's going to be either a 400k dump, a 750k dump, or like you get the point there. Like they're going to take the maximum amount of capital that can be dumped and they're going to dump it. What you can do uh, with this EIP is you can effectively say like, all right, like it would be very weird if somebody sent over X amount in a single transaction. And so if they do, uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to wait for effectively a multi-sig of interop networks. Um, and you know, this is an extremely marginal uh, difference to the end user. It's not going to change anything about what they do. They'll have to pay the additional gas for this additional interop network. But if you're sending 50 grand, you know, 50 cents, it, like that's, it's probably going to be like two cents, but it's extremely marginal to the end user. And it's a great way to actually improve safety even further at large. So like, this is the type of thinking that we haven't been doing in interoperability networks. And we just should, like, this isn't some crazy computer science thing. This is just like pragmatic engineering. And yeah, it's arbitrarily definable. You could do three, you could do a five of five, like you can define it however you want. You can have like thresholds. So if it's uh, past X, you know, you need two interop networks. If it's past Y, you need five. Um, cool. So like these are the three things that I think we really need to keep in mind as we're working with interop protocols, as we embrace this kind of like more modular uh, ecosystem at large. Sovereignty from interoperability protocols. This is coming from somebody who is building interoperability protocols. Uh, like, you should not give any interoperability protocol existential ownership over your asset, over your application, or over your blockchain. It's bad design. It's inheriting too much risk into it. It just doesn't make sense. We don't need to do that because there are open standards out there that make it so that we don't need to do that. Um, second one, you all are familiar with this, unified liquidity. The liquidity scattered all over the place right now. We need to, at minimum, abstract it away using things like XCRC20 so that there is liquidity just seamlessly flowing around. Um, and three, just very pragmatic engineering here, parameterizable security. Just make it so that in the event of a compromise, we minimize that downside. We're learning, we're growing as an industry. There's going to be hiccups along the way. Let's make it so that it's not existential, and then we get another like North Korea headline. Um, so at large, like, why do I care about this so much? Um, I care about this a lot, kind of going back to the beginning of this presentation, because I care about personal freedoms for people everywhere. And I think Ethereum has the best opportunity to present that to people. Um, where we are at today is the like incentives aren't really outweighing the risks uh, that exist in like embracing this more roll-up centric world. You know, as and this applies to asset issuers and developers. Um, you know, when I think about making my asset or my uh, DAP available across multiple platforms, there's a clear incentive of there's capital uh, in these different places. Like, that is an exciting opportunity to those actors. There's also the uh, uh, opportunity to compose with different protocols that are out there. It's not like every single DAP is deployed the same on these uh, smart contract platforms today. There's different opportunities uh, across them. And then just very obviously, uh, I want access to all the users. Everybody wants access to all the users. It's weird that we have to think about like not having access to all the users. So those are extremely clear, right? But you know, we also have to deal like we have to deal with, okay, well, if you want your asset to be available across these different platforms, you're gonna have to throw a prefix on it. And you know, it's gonna have to be like Omni ABC. I guess I'm not gonna talk about Omni. We're not doing that. We're like only promoting these open standards because we think that's just like simply a bad uh, design. 
Uh, you know, there is like fragmentation across the board right now. And then on top of that, uh, there's an un, like perpetually there will be interoperability risk. And it's not even like mitigated with these uh, parameterizable security mechanisms today. So what I care about over this year, I think we can make a ton of progress in the Ethereum ecosystem on this uh, in 2024, is really just kind of like deleting this column as much as possible. These are only going to grow. And I just want to like sh tip the scales as much as possible so that the Ethereum ecosystem can like really embrace this like modular design era that we're in right now and not have it like bake in a bunch of existential risk or like proprietary lock-in along the way. Um, because if we allow proprietary lock-in at the interop level, uh, there was no point really in doing it at the L1 level. Uh, users are going to be on L2s. You know, maybe some whales go to L1 to like do stuff every now and then. But, like 99% of users are going to be on L2s. If we allow an interoperability solution to come in and like, you know, break censorship resistance, have like, you know, just be monitoring all these transactions and permitting who can do what, uh, why do we do it on L1? Just so like the 1% can do that? No, like we need to actually establish and like preserve these properties uh, at the interop layer because there's going to be so much communication going on across these different L2s. Um, so how can we do this? Forfeiting sovereignty? Uh, just don't do that. If you're an asset issuer, use an open standard. If you're a developer, also use an open standard. Like you should not be baking these uh, interop networks directly into what you are building. It does not make sense. It increases you to unnecessary risk. It increases uh, the risk that you are exposing your users to. It is irresponsible to simply do that. Um, liquidity fragmentation. Using open standards like XERC20, we can get rid of this as well. We just need to actually migrate to these open standards. Um, and it's like, okay, well, I had a slide on how risky interop was at large. Uh, can we get rid of this? No, we can't. Uh, but I would argue we can make it a little smaller. You know, we can use parameterizable security so that we can put in guardrails as we're uh, working through this. Uh, so yeah, like as you can see, like let's tip it heavier in the direction of like people fully embracing this modular design. So what it, you know, we've been talking about the open liquidity network. This whole presentation is the concept of the open liquidity network. It's just a suite of neutral open standards to unite all the rollups. Like, let's make it easy to work across these things. They offer really exciting opportunities. Uh, and let's make sure that as we step into this, we do it in a neutral open way that doesn't like destroy the pro core properties of Ethereum at large. Um, yeah, so what does this look like if we actually achieve this? Seamless, unified liquidity, no proprietary lock-in, just open standards across the board. You can use interop networks, like, but you don't need to be locked into them. Uh, everybody preserves their sovereignty. We don't need to compromise on that. Like, that's like a false like narrative that has been presented. Uh, we preserve censorship resistance at, at the L2 layer, and we also just minimize the risk that's here, and we minimize the like negative headlines that we're bringing to the industry. Cool. So I think all this really is downstream of... Uh, it's very easy to think this like, okay, well, if I'm building an interoperability protocol in the crypto space, that's probably like, you know, equivalent to the internet protocol. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard like, uh, yeah, we're building the TCP IP of crypto or we're building the HTTP of crypto. You're not because no company or network can do that. That's how they were able to get adoption. You know, we literally saw this, like, like these comparisons to the internet are extremely overplayed, but like, America Online tried to have a proprietary interoperability standard. That was a company that had a clear business model. Even if this is an interoperability network, they have business models. There cannot be proprietary ownership at the like pure interoperability layer. So I think we have just been like thinking about the structure of these incorrectly. And I think that they're more like telecom infrastructure. Like it's not actually that these interoperability networks are TCP IP. It's like Crown Castle is like the monopoly we have running in America that runs all of our telecom infrastructure. At Omni, we're trying to build Starlink, like hyper-performant communication across these different platforms, but it's not locked in. Like it, the sole responsibility of these things is pick up a state update from one, put it at the other. That's all they are responsible for doing. And for those of us building in the ecosystem, we need to effectively design our system so that that's all they do, instead of bringing that interoperability risk directly into the platforms at large. Um, so just to enumerate some of these EIPs that we're working on, uh, shout out to the Connects team. Great work, great work here. Um, this is like a fantastic step in the right direction. Uh, and this is something we're promoting a lot right now, um, where it's just like, this is XERC20. Um, yeah, just like actually uh, allows asset issuers to maintain sovereignty as they're kind of uh, stepping into the L2 world. It also introduced the rate limiting mechanism. 
Another one that we're pushing uh, is EIP 7540. This is an extension to uh, ERC4626, which is like the standard like uh, yield interface for D5 vaults. Um, and this makes it asynchronous. This makes it really easy to interoperate across different roles, effectively giving us like cross-chain DeFi. Um, two that we've been uh, like creating internally and we'll be releasing soon, Sovereign Bridged NFTs. NFT communities need this the same way that uh, token issuers do as well. Um, and then this one is nice because this actually fits really nicely into XERC20 alongside the NFT equivalent where it's just like, hey, if, if you're sending some like some NFT that's worth like $10, cool, probably just use one interoperability network. If you're sending a board ape, maybe use two, maybe use three. Like it just makes sense to do that if you're sending like high value assets. Um, so yeah. Basically, solving roll-up fragmentation uh, while preserving neutrality, openness, and censorship resistance. That's what we care about. That's what we're doing. Um, and that's the idea of the Open Liquidity Network. If anybody's interested in collaborating with us on the EIPs that we have listed here or uh, you know, any other uh, things that you're, uh, you think you could bring to this space, uh, we're happy to chat. Um, but overall, that's, uh, that's my pitch for the Open Liquidity Network. Thank you. <laughs>